you to come to, for coming to CCN and CCN Live. Um, just a couple of things that we do want to remind you. We've said it a couple times, but CCN is partnered with Right Now Media. If you are in our email database, you should have received an email, and in that email, it will have a link to Right Now Media, and you can create your own user and name and login so that you have access to that for free for your family. You can use it on your iPad, on your phone, on your TV. So we just want to make sure that you guys all know about it. If for some reason you didn't receive that email, I need to know. So either you're not in our email database or um, something, I don't know. I downloaded every email that we had in our database and we sent it off to them. So if you didn't get it, you probably aren't in our email and we need it. So you can email us right here, ccnnazoffice at gmail.com. And just put your name in there and then you can just honestly if you put your name in there and then put I want right now media I will make sure that we send that to you this week um, if you're having trouble uh, logging in or any of that we can help you so please just make sure that we do that and that's all you want and then don't forget you can always go to ccnchurch.org we have a ladies conference that we're going to be participating in so you can go to our website soon and have all that information we'll have handouts for you it's just ladies it's on september 11th uh, more details to come but save the date also it's going to be a pj party so i'm excited <laughs> anyways we're just glad that you're here i'm gonna pray and then we want to just spend some time worshiping father we thank you so much for this day we thank you god that and today, this is the day that you've made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I just thank you that, that we really are safe, and we really are defended, and we are taken care of in you, Father. We, we just thank you, Lord, and we know, God, that it's so easy to be focused on ourselves and our circumstances and our situations. We know it's so easy to just have our eyes on other people and the things around us. But Father, we know, we know, we know, we know that if we would place you on the throne of our hearts, that, that everything just begins to make sense and come together. And even though you said that we will have trouble in this life, that we could take heart, that you would overcome the world. So we just... We bask in that peace today. We bask in that truth. And we just thank you, Lord, that right now, right now in this minute, Father, that your love we cannot be separated from. Nothing too high, too wide. Anything in all creation, there's nothing that can separate us from your love. You put that in your word so that we would know it. And so we hold on to that truth. We thank you for this time of worship, and we give you our very best, even if it doesn't feel like it's much, God. We give you our very best, and we know that you receive all the praises. Your word says you inhabit the praises of your people. And so we give you, our Father, all of the praise, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Levi, Levi says amen. Amen. chapter 18 says I love you O Lord my strength the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer my God my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved saved by from him. So we thank God for that today. Thank you. 
Defeating discouragement today. And I think that's something that some everyone is going through in some form or shape. So I think there's some valuable things through God's Word today. I, God's Word is always valuable. And I think we need to make sure that... Um, so if you got, got your... Like even your notepad on your on your phone, get it out and take some notes and, and uh, follow along with me. We're in Nehemiah chapter 4. Um, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. Uh, can't edit that. We're alive, okay? So, um, but um, Nehemiah chapter 4, Murphy's Law states, if anything can go wrong, uh, it will. And here's, here's another uh, law similar to Murphy's Law, and it goes like this. You will never find a lost article until you replace it. That's pretty cool, isn't it? You will never... How many have done that? You know, all of a sudden you... You've lost something, you've gone out and bought it, and then all of a sudden you go, oh, there it is. So that's kind of like a Murphy's Law. So in Nehemiah 4, we're chapter 4, we're looking at, at Nehemiah, and it's everything seems to be, to be going wrong all at once. So in chapter 1, we've seen Nehemiah, how he cared enough to pray. And in chapter 2, we saw how Nehemiah cared enough to get involved. And I hope, if there are, if there are two things that, that one thing that I, I would encourage you to do right now is, is make sure you're praying. In this season of time, we need godly wisdom. We need to see God's face. So we need people that are willing to pray. And then, as God begins to unfold the plan on how we are to move forward as a church, as we are already doing, but we need to have people that are caring enough to get involved um, we see how God moved Nehemiah from the prosperity of, per uh, of Persia all the way to the desolation of Jerusalem. I mean, he is moving, <clears throat> he is moving from a five-star hotel to a dump. Basically, that's what's happening. Okay, he's going from the best of the best to the worst of the worst. You ever been there before? Um, <clears throat> so last week, we were introduced to the wall workers. That was in chapter 3. And we discovered that in kingdom work that no one can do everything... But everyone can do someone. No one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Uh, Mother Teresa says, I can do some things that you can't. You can do some things that I can't. But together, we can do some wonderful things for God and for His glory. Amen? Uh, so no one can do everything, but everyone can do something. Leaders, uh, those of us that are fully devoted followers of Christ, we need to set the place, pace. Uh, God uses all kinds of people. They come in all shapes and sizes, all kinds of gifts, t gifts talents, um, everything. Uh, some will not work. We found out that wasn't too exciting, but we're not supposed to look at those that don't work. Some will do more work. Some will work with passion. Some are going to work with families. And because some works harder, some with more zeal. We're seeing right now that as we move into, we're seeing the project. It's actually coming along quite, quite good now. I mean, uh, it's actually progressing. And, uh, but when we come to chapter 4, things also get more complicated. And Murphy's Law shows up and reminds Nehemiah that in everything, if everything seems to be going well, you obviously overlook something. Have you ever had that? Like, you know, if everything seems to be going, be going so well, you're overlooking something. So today I want to talk about an epidemic that is spreading across the world, okay? Uh, it, it, it's attacking our home. Sound familiar? I'm not talking about the coronavirus. Uh, it's attacking our, our homes, our communities, our schools. It's, talk, it's, uh, it's our, our counties, our, our states, um, our world. Um, and so what this is called, it's called discouragement. Discouragement. And there are at least three possible, uh, I mean, uh, uh, three things that make it such a potent problem. The first thing is discouragement is universal. By the way, if you're feeling discouraged or if you have felt discouraged, remember you're not the only one that's felt discouraged. It's universal. None of us are immune to 
discouragement. Everyone you've ever known has been discouraged. So if you've been discouraged or haven't been discouraged, remember there are those around you that have been discouraged. Um, it, it's reoccurring. Discourage, discouragement is reoccurring. So being discouraged once, doesn't, wouldn't it be great if we could just be discouraged once? And then we could become immune to it. You know, get a shot. Hey, got my shot. But it's not that way. You can be discouraged over and over again, which I, I realize discouragement has been a reoccurring, reoccurring problem, a challenge with a lot of people that are struggling with this whole idea of being discouraged. Um, and it's highly, by the way, discouragement is highly contagious. So discouragement spreads by even casual contact. People can become disheartened because you're discouraged. Okay, so... But it's also the same thing. You can be bummed out because other people get discouraged. So today we're going to look at the causes and cures for discouragement. So there are two main types of discouragement. One set of problems come, come at us from the outside, okay? So we're going to, we're going to talk about the, the external causes first, and then we're going to talk about a, a set of attacks that come on the inside and they're internal. So they're external Causes and there are the internal causes. Are so with me? So internal causes of discouragement. The wall workers were uh, were initially excited. Okay, they're they're coming in. They're gathering in groups. Woo hoo! Everything's going great. The team's there. Amen. Everybody's there, and they begin to work with great anticipation and joy. And then it says in Nehemiah four six. Look at this. The wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, and the people had worked with what? They worked with enthusiasm. The NIV, the NIV states that people worked with all, all their hearts. Um, they were passionately working toward the cause of rebuilding. Amen? And so, but they were, they were only half the height. So everything was going well. The people were excited. The wall was going up. And then... Murphy Law says in, something happened. Getting the work started on the wall was a major achievement. This was, this was a lot of work. Remember, Nehemiah had to organize everything. But keeping the workers working was such a tough assignment. Henry Ford says, coming together is a beginning. Staying together is progress. And working together is success. And I truly believe that that's one of the big challenges that God will bring about, about, about to us as a church is how can we continue to work together and bring glory to God here in, in Coolidge, Arizona. Amen. Because that's what we want to do and, and the surrounding areas. We believe that, that God is going to do that. Uh, someone has said that exhilaration, exhilaration is that feeling you get just after a great idea hits you and right before you realize what's wrong with it. So for instance, I remember the exhilaration of my first bungee drop, okay? I remember the exhilaration of getting wrapped in that, uh, that, old, that suit. And I can remember being, uh, the exhilaration of thinking, man, I'm all the way up here at the top. And then basically you're going to pull this button and then all of a sudden you just drop into thin air. And I'm thinking, this is a bad idea. You know what I'm saying? I was exhilarated. I, did, I was really excited at the beginning. But at the second time, man, I, I thought, man, this is a bad idea. What if this thing doesn't hold? What if this thing snaps? What if this is old fabric? And then I kept thinking, boy, this is a bad idea. What really made it a bad idea was after it was all said and done, I screamed like a girl, by the way. <laughs> However, a girl screams. You want to scream like a girl for me, Richard? Well, just, there you go. Richard got it for me. And so he screamed like, but what was really sad about the whole thing, those that were with me at, at Six Flags when this happened, understand what I'm talking about. The sad thing is after it was all over, we went to see the video. There was no video. And so they said, if you'd like to, you could do it again free on us. <laughs> we got the video a second time. And I still screamed like a girl. And I still thought it was a bad idea. Think about that. But when, think about this also. When God is at work, remember this. The enemy is also at work. Ephesians says that we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against every, evil rulers and authorities. The enemy's real. He's out there. Uh, he's, it's this unseen world against mighty powers 
against this dark world and against evil spirits in the, in the heavenly places. So when God's people, when you and I, as we continue to move forward and we say, hey man, we, we're going to take kingdom priorities uh, serious around here because kingdom work never is done. Amen? It never stops. We're continually reaching out to love others for Christ. But every time we move forward, Satan stirs up agitators. He's always, there's, he's going to stir things up and he's going to try to block the work of God. You want to write this down. This is very powerful. Opposition is not only an evidence that God is blessing. Opposition is not only an evidence that God is blessing, but it is also an opportunity for us to grow. Evidence that God is blessing, opportunity for us to grow. Amen. So there are three enemies used two uh, there are three enemies used two types of external force. The first one was ridicule, okay? So in Nehemiah 4, 1 and 2, San, San Ballot was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into rage and he began to mock the Jews. Okay, so immediately the enemy is going to ridicule and mock you. So no matter what you are going through, that's the enemy's challenge. He wants to ridicule you. He wants to mock you. He wants to say, you're not going to make a difference in the world. You can never be that believer that God wants you to be. You can never make a difference in your family. He wants to ridicule you because he wants to mock you. And it's a saying in front of his friends. So Sandal says in front of his friends, and he gets his army officers. What does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're going to do? Look at the ridicule. Poor feeble Jews think they're going to do. Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do you actually think they can make something of stone from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? This is the third time in the book that we see Sandal. He is the stiffest opposition against Nehemiah. Um, and he is always standing against the work of God, rejecting and ridiculing everything that Nehemiah is trying to accomplish. And remember that the enemy will do the same to us. He will try to do any, he will use ridicule every time to try to discourage us. Because ridicule is the language of the devil. He loves to ridicule you. I don't know about you, but I've sensed that so many times. He just wants to ridicule me. He said, tell me, I'm never good enough. We'll never find the answer. You'll, you'll, never, you'll never do enough to accomplish anything. But ridicule is a language of the enemy. Goliath ridiculed David when the shepherd boy met the, the giant with only a sling in his hand. Uh, the soldiers ridiculed Jesus during his trial, and the crowd taunted him while he was hanging on the cross. Sandballot and his buddies had begun to ridicule the workers even before the work started. As a matter of fact, if you look in, in, in Nehemiah 2, 19, but when Sandballot and Tobiah and, and Geshem and the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed, scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing? Are you rebelling against the king? That's this, there's this ridicule. So here in chapter 4, he is making a speech, by the way. Sandal's making a speech before all of his armies, and he's trying to pull them in on the laughter. You know what I'm talking about? He's trying to, he's trying to make fun of, and hopefully that, that, that the Jewish people are going to become the butt of the joke. And so he's trying to get everybody to laugh at them. Have you ever been, everybody, ever been in a crowd where one person starts to laugh, and then all of a sudden you see something, and they see it's funny, and then someone else sees it, and all of a sudden the crowd is laughing? Well, that's exactly what he's trying to do. He's trying to to intensify the power of ridicule. So right now, he called the workers feeble, which means they're withered and, and they're miserable. He ridiculed the job they were doing by asking four taunting questions. These guys, by the way, are bullies. All right? And, and the enemy is the same way. The enemy is a bully. And he will try everything to ridicule you, to make you feel like they're, they're, that you're, you'll never amount to nothing. He said, build the walls in a single day, Nehemiah 4.2. How could a remnant of feeble Jews hope to build a wall strong enough to protect the city from a mighty army? So that he's ridiculed. They, they must have made the Samaritan's army just break out into laughter. The second ridicule, by just offering a few sacrifices. Don't pass this up, by the way, Nehemiah 4.2. Samuel is saying that it will take more than prayer. He's saying, Angelina, he's saying it will take more than prayer and worship to rebuild the city. Many people, right, 
will try to move ahead of prayer and worship, but I believe that the greatest work to be done will always occur, occur during prayer and worship. That's the reason why Nehemiah started with prayer and worship before he went into this battle. And we must remember that every time we pray, it makes a difference. We need to remember, remember that every time we pray, God's ears are up and he hears. And what, what happens when we pray? Our ears go up so we can hear God's prayer, pray, hearing us so we can hear from God. Will they finish in a single day? You've been there. I mean, we're there right now. I wonder, when is this going to be over? When are we going to see an end in sight? And, and so the enemies can take that and he can be, use that to discourage us. I know that there are moms and dads and teachers and, and uh, administration, so many people out there, especially with the school thing, that, that could be out there. This could all be so discouraging. Like, when will, when will this ever be finished? And then he says, do they actually think they can make something of stone from a rubbish sheet and charred ones at that. And he's talking about the building materials. They were old and they were damaged and they were used. And how could, how could these old damaged used pieces of stone make a strong wall? But remember this, from man's view, that may be true. Man was looking at the rubble, but from God's view, all things are possible. I want you to get your eyes off the rubble today. Because rubble is where we get, dis get discouraged. When we get our eyes on the rubble, rubble, we're going to get discouraged. Get your eyes off the rubble and get your eyes on to God. And remember, God can do all things. There is nothing that is impossible with God. And God is ruling and reigning right now. God is on the throne. He is large and He is in charge. Amen? You can write that down. He is large and He's in charge. Okay? All right. So... And Nehemiah 4.3, now we have Tobiah's turn. He comes to ridicule the workers, and he tries a joke. And basically, in verse 3, he says to them, you know what? Your walls are so, are so insufficient, they're not even strong enough, that if this little tiny fox would go across your wall, it would bring them down. So here he is. He, he continues to make fun. Okay, so the enemy is always trying to ridicule you. He's trying to make fun. And so what he's trying to do is he's trying to bring about an avalanche of discouragement into their lives. Okay, have you ever been there? So when you begin to look around, look around and, and look at all this, the challenges that you face and you don't keep your eyes on God, if you look around, it can cause an avalanche of discouragement in your life, right? It can really, it can be going like, if you begin to look like, well, this is wrong and that's wrong and I don't know what we're going to do about here. I don't know what we're going to do about that and what we're going to do this and that and this. I mean, you can look at all over and there are hundreds and hundreds of challenges, by the way. Let me say this, challenges. They are challenges that we will overcome, but they're challenges that we face. But if you look at them too deep, all of a sudden it will bring this avalanche of discouragement into your life. And that is exactly what the enemy was trying to do. So whenever you attempt, by the way, to get involved in the work of God, and, and you'll always face ridicule, okay? No matter what you're doing, when you're trying to do something for God, expect ridicule. By the way, if you're not doing nothing for God, you're probably not experiencing that ridicule. <laughs> right? So whenever you start saying, man, I'm, I'm going to be serious about kingdom business because kingdom work is never done, remember this, expect it, and, and don't stop working because ridicule will come. So ridicule. The number, the second thing of external discouragement was re repression. If you look in verses 7 and 8, it starts off by saying, but when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. So the enemy was doing, they were doing all they could to discourage them, but the walls were being repaired and the enemy was furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and they throwed us into confusion. So think about this. There are, there are Senbala, Tobiah, the Arabs, Ammonites, Ashadites, whatever. They're all surrounding them, all right? All right? They're on all sides, but this is how I fight my battle, all right? This is how I fight my battle. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, right? 
So there's a, there's a choice in every situation. You can look and, and look at the enemy that may be surrounding, or you can look to the God that's surrounding. And then you've got to ask yourself, who's greater? Amen? Who's greater? I mean, it, it may look like there's a surrounding enemy, but God, give us eyes to see you because you are surrounding us. You are greater than any of these enemies that are pressing against us. See, God's people sometimes have difficulty working together, but the people of the world have no problem uniting in opposition of the work of the Lord. And let me tell you something, that every person, there are people on this earth, many, 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 many of them, that are against the work of the Lord. They're all over the place. They're everywhere. They're in our government. They're everywhere. They're leaders. And let me tell you, they are taking advantage of everything that there is happening to try to make us be discouraged. But guess what? This is how I I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Amen? I'm going to keep my eyes focused on Him. So those were the external uh, causes. And then now we have the internal causes of discouragement. Pressure from without creates problems within. Okay, so, so what's happening on the outside, if we don't get the right perspective, can cause problems within Within. So that's why I said, remember, get your eyes on the right same thing. So just like today, it's so easy to inter internalize the words of the enemy and feel like giving up. All right? A lot of people feel like giving up. And we're seeing what happened here in verse 10. In Nehemiah 14, it says, then the people of Judah began to complain. And one of the things I want to encourage you right now don't complain and don't criticize. That again, that's 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 a that's a that's a work of the enemy. Because this 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 discouragement that came within came from within. What happened was the people, the body of Christ began to well the body began to complain. They began to complain against the situation. And because they began to complain and got their eyes off the Lord that began to bring discouragement with the people. So do you see what I'm saying? And, and I'm not saying that we're supposed to put on a fake face, but I think there's a key here. So we need to always continue to go to the Lord with everything that we're facing. Always go to the Lord. Begin to bring, don't bring everything to God because if we start, if we start complaining and we start criticizing, then all of a sudden it will begin to break down the body and what God is doing. So we want to make sure that, so what happens here is because, the, uh, but, why, but, why do, but why do they start to complain? I think um, we need to look at some causes of this internal discouragement because these are very real right now. I think the first cause of this, you know, this internal uh, discouragement, this, this, this maybe even you can call it a complaining spirit. Uh, you, you probably even know someone like that, don't you? <laughs> There are people that just that have that spirit of complaining. Um, but basically what happens is this, this internal cause of discouragement, uh, they're tired, basically what's happening. What's causing is it's fatigue. Have you ever been tired? Do you notice that when you get tired, um, how, how it's easier to be kind of a little bit more negative? Like it's like, think about this. The workers are getting tired. They were hitting it hard. They needed some rest. The strength of the, of the, of the burden bearers, it says, is failing in the NASB. The strength of the laborers is giving out. Um, the giving out, it carries with this idea of staggering and, and, and stumbling. Um, notice that the wall now is half to the height, and that's when people start like either coming in or coming out. I've even noticed that myself in, in, in different projects that we've done, is that it's easy to start a project it's more difficult to finish the project. And it's normally in the middle where people get discouraged and they get tired and they get fatigued. So fatigued. So what so what do you do? What do you do with all that? What do you do with all that? I think the, the best thing for us to do is to remember to never throw in the towel and just step back. So if you're fatigued, basically what you need to do, you need to step back. You need some pins breathe and you need to spend some alone time with God. You need, to, you need to get in your Bible, you need to get in prayer 
and you need to ask God for help because one of the greatest ways to defeat fatigue is to rest, okay? So for some reason, maybe we're not getting the rest we need. So we need to make sure because if you're not resting, especially right now, moms and dads, everything that's going on, you need a good night's sleep. You need to rest. You know, I, I, and again, I don't have any children in my home, but you need to figure out how to step back and you know how to breathe. You need to know how to find rest. You need to find a Sabbath. You need to make time to breathe again and get rid of uh, get rid of those things. So uh, to get you to deal with your fatigue. So uh, um, fatigue, and then we, we take from fatigue. Uh, the second thing I, I'm seeing is. The second cause of internal uh, discouragement is, is frustration. Um, they became discouraged because they were so aggravated with the situation. In verse 10, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. So the second cause of this internal discouragement was frustration with the situation. And what happens here is that they are literally frustrated because they can't achieve something. And we need to realize that whatever God begins, God will end. And they were frustrated because they got their eyes off of God. And they thought that it was their responsibility to fix the problem. And so instead of, instead of turning to God and, and, and trusting Him, they began to get frustrated. So they thought, well, you know... I, I, by, by the way, we are not able is the rally cry of all who take their eyes off the Lord and start looking at themselves and their problems. When we talk about we are not able, but what, with God, all things are possible. And then the third cause of this discouragement, we got fatigue and we got frustration. The third cause of discouragement is fear. Okay? So you're walking with me a little bit now, you're seeing it? So this internal fatigue, frustration, now there's this fear. Um, the enemies of the Lord's work had struck fear in the hearts of God's people, and they felt like giving up. They, did, they, were, they were tired with the walls. And so remember when they, what they said in verse 10, we cannot rebuild the walls. So in verse 10 they said, we cannot rebuild it. But notice in verse 12, who gets afraid the quickest. And what happens again, here it is, is they, that, that all of the surrounding People, the actual people that are around them are the ones that are afraid. So they're surrounded by fearful people. Uh, they're, they're surrounded by uh, a lot of pessimists. As a matter of fact, he talks about uh, they, they have like 10 times the people that are going to come against us. And, and he's basically what happens is 10 is like a 10 times, 10 times, 10. So all of these enemies, they keep talking about the enemies are coming against us. Have you ever been around someone that just talks about all the bad things, all the bad things, all the bad things? And basically what's happening here is exactly that, that all they can do, they... They begin to get fear because all of the people around them, instead of looking to God, they begin to look to themselves. And then the people around them begin to, to be fearful because they're looking at all the enemies and they, they don't realize that God is greater. That the one who began the work on the wall will be the one who finishes the work on the wall. The most affected by fear are those who live near, by the way, pessimistic people. So if you want to limit the depressing thoughts that bring fear into your life, don't hang around negative people. <laughs> That's kind of hard, isn't it? Because fear puts us in a frame of mind where we can not only be discouraged and we can all be deceived. So, you know, the, the whole thing is they're, they're, they're talking about we're going to never finish this project. But remember this. 52 days later, by the way, spoiler alert, they don't ever attack. Okay, 52 days later, 52 days later, what's been hundreds of years is now rebuilt, right? Um, so think about this, the enemies never do attack. Um, uh, scared to life. Statistics from this book of why you shouldn't let fear rule your life. 60% of our fears are totally unfounded. 20% are already behind us. 10% are so petty that they don't make any difference. And 5% are real, but we can't do anything about them. And 5% are real, and we can do something about them. So think about this. So some things, don't let fear rule your life. 
So now I'm going to cut, we went, we went to causes, now we're going to, go to talk about the cures in closing for discouragement. Now we know how, now we know some of the causes of discouragement. Ridicule and repression, okay? And they lead to fatigue, frustration, and fear. Can I say that one more time? Ridicule and repression can lead to fatigue, frustration, and fear. What is happening in the walls of, of Jerusalem back those days is happening the same with us today. Some of these things are happening in our homes, in our lives, in our communities. So the good news is that discouragement, if you're discouraged, it's a curable disease. Aren't you glad for that? There is a cure for that discouragement. His name is Jesus. Amen? And uh, God, you don't have to live with a chronic condition anymore. So we're going to look at three, three cures for discouragement. The first cure is to request God's help. Okay? Request. Nehemiah began by praying and requesting God's help in chapter 1 for Jerusalem. Begin with prayer. Request God's help. Wherever you are at, bring God into the situation. It, it doesn't matter whether it's your marriage it doesn't matter whether it's your family, your job, whatever it is, bring God in to the situation. Request God's help. Hey God, I need help here. God, I need help here. When you begin to get, get God's ears, and He has your ears, He'll begin to speak and He'll give you His perspective. Nehemiah requested God's help in chapter 1. When he was trying to find the favor of the king so he could get all the supplies. Remember, he was that was the second week he was needing all the supplies to get to build. He didn't he didn't go to the king, he went to the king and he said, Hey king, give me favor in the sight of this earthly king. And he prayed about it. Now in chapter four, he prays two different times. He looked up before he launched out. Okay? So important. Make sure that you're looking up before you're launching out. In every area of your life, small and big, bring it to God. Look up before you launch out. Hey God, what do you want me to do here? Before I launch out, I want to know what I want to know what you're playing. He prayed before proceeding. Amen. So he says in Nehemiah 4, hear us, O God. That's where he starts at. This was a this, by the way, this is a powerful prayer. By the way, say that with me. Hear us. Oh God. One more time. Hear us. Oh God. Do you believe He hears us? He does. As a matter of fact, that little prayer right there began a great conversation with the Lord. Hear us, oh God. And He's up there saying, yeah, I'm ready to hear. Bring me some praise. Bring me some worship. Bring me your prayer request, your needs. I'm bigger than anything that you face today. Hear us, oh God. But this was quite a prayer. He, by the way, he, you know how we're supposed to pray for our enemies? He wasn't praying for our, his enemies um, to become believers, but, but instead for God to judge them. He says this in uh, verse 5. He says, he, says, uh, he says, Hear us, O God, we're so despised, boomerang their ridicule on their heads. Have, have their enemies cart them off as war trophies to a land of no return. Don't forgive their iniquities. Don't wipe away their sin. They've insulted the builders. That is a, that is a powerful prayer. But, he's, but, but Nehemiah isn't praying a prayer of vengeance, by the way. This is an understandable and honest prayer. He knew that the enemies were really fighting against God. Okay? So, hey, Nehemiah didn't give him a lecture. He didn't form raiding parties. He didn't create propaganda campaigns to put a different spin on things. He said, here is, oh God. You having trouble with some area of your life? Get down on your knees and say, here is, oh God. I'm going to battle because I know there's a battle out there, but I need you to hear us. I need to request God's help because the battle always belongs to the Lord. So here's the principle we can learn from Nehemiah. When people talk against you, don't talk back. Talk to God. Don't talk back. Talk to God. But in my distress, in Psalms 18.6, it says, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. 
My cry to him reached his ears. In Psalms 37, 5, it says, Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. The second thing he did, by the way, the second cure is to reorganize your priorities, okay? Now, this one's pretty short and simple. He says, therefore, I station some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the, exposed, at, at the exposed places, posted them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. So Nehemiah, by the way, really quick, I know this is a lot, but Nehemiah had already organized the people in chapter 3, right? Remember, he put them in clans, he assigned them parts of the wall, they were all doing it, and they had finished half of their tasks. Now, they're half done. A new situation had come about. Remember, there all, there's all these people that are gathering against them. So there's a new situation. So they have to change in organization. Okay? You have to change. So insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Right? That was, that was Albert Einstein. Realize that that's where we're at as a family, as a church, as a community. That we, we have to really change and organize differently. Amen? And so we need to, again, we need to ask God to help us to know how to reorganize our priorities. So what does it mean now, God, in this, in this, in this time of our lives? What does it mean? So I need to reorganize. So I'm going to pray about it, I'm going to, and then I'm going to reorganize my priorities according to God and His plans. And then the third cure is to remember who God is. Okay? Remember who God is. After looking everything over and sensing the discouragement with his team, Nehemiah rallied his troops. It says, Then as I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, Don't be afraid of the enemy. 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 We are more than conquerors. We are, more than, we are victors. And the greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ. Don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord, who is great and glorious. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and, and, and your homes. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. See, Nehemiah knew, even in the face of opposition, that the success of the wall was wholly dependent upon God who inspired its beginning. So, remember who God is. I think it's so important for us to, to do that today. Remember who God is. We, re we need to remember the Lord, remember His promises. We need to remember His kindness, His goodness, His faithfulness, His mercy. Remember His power because our God is great and awesome. Remember Him. So we, we got to make sure that we move. That we move from, from uh, being rubble gazers to being God gazers. Because that's, that's the way to, to fight fear, fatigue, and frustration. That, that's the way to get rid of this discouragement is for us to get our eyes off of the situation. I, I said this earlier in the first service. It needs to step back. Okay, it needs to step back from social media somewhat. I want you to be informed. I want you to know what's happening in your world. But sometimes you just have to take a social media fast. You need to step back from things, especially because the news can be so critical. And we're not for sure even half the time what we're hearing is truth. And so you need to step back. Okay, you need to make sure. But also remember this. And, let, and you remember this, okay? Over 2,000 years ago, God sent His Son to walk among us. He came and He died on a cross so that you and I could be forgiven. He died so our sins could be washed away, so we could be white as clean. He died on a cruel cross. He took our shame, our guilt. He took, by the way, 2,000 years ago, this very situation, He took it upon His back. It was taken care of. I mean, He came and He died. Then they buried him in a tomb. They sealed it. And then three days later, God sent some angels. They rolled the stone away. Jesus came back to life, began to walk among people, filling them with hope. 
He was raised from the dead. And then he said, I'm going away. I'm going to the Father. He ascended to the Father. He's now at the right hand of the Father. And he's praying for us. And he sees what's going on. But this is the key. Remember this. Jesus defeated death. Is there anything that we are facing today that's greater than death? There really isn't. It, it may seem like it, but it's really not. And if Jesus defeated death, he's going to defeat this situation. So we need to make sure that we're not rebel gazers. We're God gazers. Keep our eyes fixed on the one who defeated the grave. Because he's the one who will defeat the discouragement that comes in our life. So make sure that you're protecting your heart. Make sure that what's hindering your heart is coming from God. These guys who are building the wall, the enemy tried ridicule and repression, tried to get them discouraged. And, and, and so they, they made sure, Nehemiah made sure that they got their eyes off of the people that were trying to bring ridicule and repression and get their eyes on the Lord. And I want to do the same for you today. Amen? So let's pray. Lord, as we, as we come to you today, we give you thanks and we give you praise. And we worship you, Lord. There is so much, God, today in your word. So much truth. So much light, Lord. Thank you, Father, for helping us to see your presence, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for loving us. Thank you so much, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for defeating death. Thank you that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us. Thank you that we can have a relationship with you. Thank you, God, that today we don't, even though things can be discouraging and, 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 and uh, challenging, Lord, thank you that we don't have to be rebel grazers, gazers, but that we can be God gazers, that we can keep our eyes fixed on you today, Lord. And Lord, I pray, Father, for those that are watching God through uh, Facebook today, Lord. I pray for those that are who are here in the sanctuary. And, and I pray, Father, right now, as you, as you bow your heads and you close your eyes, I, I, just, I just want to encourage you right now to take one step. I want, to, I want to encourage you where you're at, where you're sitting at right now. God's been talking to you. And you, you, you realize that maybe even now that you've been, you've been looking at so much of the rubble and not God. And you've been discouraged. And, and you just need God to help you. I want you right now to just raise your hand. And let God see your hands. Wherever you're at. And say, God, I, I need help. I need help with some discouragement. And know that God sees it. Know that God sees it. Lord, I thank you today for the hands that were raised here and for all those hands that, that only you saw, Father, that were raised today. I thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. I thank you that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I thank you that I am more than a conqueror today. I thank you, Jesus, that I can fix my eyes on you because you're where my help comes from, Lord. God, I'm confident that you're, you're doing a new thing, Lord. And as we pray to you, Father, and as you begin to reorganize not only families and lives, but our church, Lord, for your glory, we pray, Father, that you would be glorified in everything that's said and done. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people say Amen. Well, God bless you. I hope you've had a great day. And uh, Nehemiah chapter 4, just go read it again at, at, in your house today. It's, there's so much in it. Um, uh, we, we are not having a Wednesday night um, Facebook Bible study, so uh, you should uh, make sure that you have right now media downloaded so you go, go, go do it first, but we're not having a Bible study on Wednesday night. Um, but God bless you. Have a great week. Um, Amen. Be blessed. Well, oh, don't forget the offering plates back there. And thank you all, everybody who's been so faithful in their ties and offering. God is still uh, doing a mighty thing here at College Church of the Nazareth. Amen. God bless you. Be blessed.